Eko, I, I always love talking property with you because you're somebody who's, I'll say, done quite a lot within the property space and has quite a good sense of where the market is. And because you're still an active investor as well, you've really got great insights that can help us make um, sense of the next best steps that we can take. And perhaps let's go through then that first technique that you think is um, you know, is important. Or actually, before we get to the technique, uh, uh, because I know we're going to go through five really great techniques. I think first, let's look at an overview of how we should be looking at um, getting value for our money when we're buying property. Because I don't think everybody has the, the best sort of overarching picture of getting the best value for money when you're buying properties. Uh, before we even go into the various techniques that we can then use to get that best value for our money. Okay, so I think for overview uh, on what you have to look at before you buy a property, and to me, I go back to the basics again, and I, and I think I've said this several times on this show, is the numbers, right? So understand the numbers. You need to be able to, like, like you said, just to summarize what you've just said, is to buy low and sell high, right? You need to know your exit strategy. What's your exit strategy going to look like? Are you buying to sell in the next five years? That's the question you need to ask yourself. Are you buying to hold and create a legacy for your family and create a generational wealth for uh, 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 out of that property? And if you're going to do that, then I think the exit strategy, you still need to have an exit strategy. And to me, my exit strategy, because I use the latter, the exit strategy has always been getting the bank to finance my deal. And hence, the numbers must make sense. Hence, it means that if I buy a property for a rent or I get a bank to give me a rent to buy a property, I need to find a tenant that's going to give me a rent 50 cents or, a, or two rent so that I'll be able to go back to the bank and say, hey, I'm supposed to give you a rent, but now I'm giving, I've got two rent. Why don't you give me more money? And that's what the bank look for. Bank likes to bank, bank, uh, bank people like us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the mindset needs to be right. I think that's where we need to start. You know, Eka, I'm actually going to um, confess something. And one of the things that, and I was having this conversation with one of my partners is um, sometimes it's, it's easy to have a, a buy strategy or it's relatively easier to come up with a buy strategy and sort of have all your ducks in a row when it comes to how, what informs what you're buying, what informs how you're buying it, what informs even the, the interest rate that you want to get and up to which point you're willing to go with, you know, the interest rate or the LTV. So um, you can have a really great buy strategy and even have a really great operational strategy, but not all of us have a great sell strategy, right? Or a great exit strategy. And this is certainly something that I am very guilty of that when it comes to the buy strategy, operational strategy, that's fantastic. But the sell strategy isn't always that great um, because sometimes when you're buying and you're doing the operational aspect, you don't think you want, you're going to exit a particular deal, especially if it's the first sort of five years. You don't really anticipate that you're going to exit it. And even if the exit isn't because of financial pressure, sometimes it may actually be there are other deals that um, yes. make more financial sense that you want to access. And the quickest way for you to be able to access them is to you know offload some of your assets but because you didn't actually plan for what the exit strategy is going to be, then you find yourself in a very difficult uh, position. So I think that is one of those things that we can probably actually have a very separate conversation with, uh, because I know I myself you know, need a few pointers um, on the sell side of things and the exit strategy, because it does get to be one of those things that can be a bit um, difficult to wrap my head around. But then, yeah. okay, then let's get to that first you know, technique for our viewers at home. So we want to get value for our money and we want to make sure that we are able to find and buy properties at a great um, you know, amount. What is then the first technique that we should consider using in order for us to be able to do so? Okay, so... Just for starters and to clarify things, I think I just need to let everyone know that there are so many ways and strategies to use to be able to find and buy affordable investment properties, right? But today I'm going to share this, this five basic techniques that I use that got me out of the right race. So it's this, uh, I've tried them, they're proven, tested, and they work. 
So whoever's listening to this must have a pen and paper because they're going to make themselves millions. Anyway, so the first, the first strategy is to look for rundown properties or problem properties. I know people say, why run down or why problem properties? Because you definitely, when it's a problem property, you're able to get it at a discounted rate. And that is what you're looking at. And, by, and that's what I started by saying, you buy low and you sell high, right? And you take the problem properties, you compare them with a well-managed income earning property that's commanding top rent or top dollar in the market, right? You need to then find out what, is, what makes that property that's commanding higher rents in the market, what are they doing right? Compare them with your bad property that you've just bought and then try to, try to get them to a, a running order so that you can make it worth your effort. So that, that's the uh, step one or technique and, and one. When, when we talk about rundown um, properties, maybe echo, what should be the one thing we should look out for? Because I know that there are also so many people at home who've heard horror stories about buying rundown properties. And some people are probably very scared of buying a rundown property because of that reason. So what should probably be top of mind when it comes to what we should try and avoid um, when you think about you know, considering buying a rundown property? Okay, so Zama, that's a very good question. So in 2009, remember when the xenophobic attack, I think 2008, 2009, the xenophobic attack, people were moving out of Beria, Yovo, Hillbro, and that's when I started buying properties in Hillbro. And everybody around me, at that time I was in the bank, and everybody around me said, oh, the guys are going to hijack your property and the rest. So what I did, that worked to my favor is I bought into body corporate, obviously a dilapidated body corporate. You get to find who the caretaker is, find the key individuals in the, in the building, that or the security guy. You know, the people that people look down upon, those are the people that make you millions. So we need to really respect the security guys. You need to respect the caretakers because those are the guys that are actually making us money. You then ask them, that you've seen this property online, this agent is selling or this owner is selling the property, how legit is it? This, you will get a whole lot of information about it. And through that, you wouldn't believe, but in 2009, I actually bought a whole bachelor for 10,000 rand because they, there was a, it was a divorce um, matter and the guy wanted to get out of it as quickly as possible. And that's, you know, and a caretaker took me there. So the important thing is that you need to find people. You need to ask a lot of questions. That is the very important thing. Even though it's run down, go in that property, step in that property, have a feel. You know, I always say I need to feel the spirit in that property. And if the spirit is aligned to my spirit, then I'll buy, you know. <laughs> so, so step in there, stay a couple of prayers and, and, and get it done. <laughs> When you say that, Echo, I actually think about how, you know, there'll be people who will be like, also bring your Mpepo, make sure that you just like are in alignment with your place. But I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, because I think different places, you're able to get a sense about them um, and a vibe about them. I mean, obviously, that's not the primary reason why you would go and buy a place. Sometimes you can get a very good vibe, but when you go and you run your numbers, you realize that actually this is this doesn't make financial sense, yeah. but it, it definitely helps when you're able to run your numbers, the numbers make sense. And when you do go there, uh, it's, you know, the place is, is in alignment with you as well. And it's un aligned with your spirit. I think that certainly does give you a bit of a confidence boost that look, uh, I feel good about this place and the numbers also say that it's a good buy. Uh, and that's how I always say to people, I mean, you, you need to view a place. You cannot not view a place. Uh, I mean, you can start with running the numbers, but always, always view a place, especially when you're starting off. I mean, even at my level, I still view a place. It, it doesn't matter what the case is. I mean, if, if, for example, I can't physically view a place, I'd rather send somebody and we're then on a video call. I'm like, yeah. here, I want you to go here. I want, to visit, I want to see this on video. How does it look like? What does it smell like? Um, and it's such an important thing to be able to do because 
uh, so many things can be missed when we don't do um, that viewing. And, mm. and, and then, Echo, I know that the, the second technique is around distressed cells. Take us through, you know, that particular technique. Okay, so by distressed sales, we're talking about foreclosures, we're talking about auction deals, we're talking about bank quick sales, liquidation, divorce estates, like I mentioned previously, they all fall under the general heading of distressed properties, right? And if you're really, really looking for a bargain, that is where you have to start. That distressed properties are the best way to go. And where do you find distressed sales, somebody may ask? You get... That's true, the uh, auction list, because there's always the auctioneers or the sheriff's offices by law are mandated to, to publish or make whatever the sale, wherever the sale is public, right? And, and also sometimes what I do, my personal favorite, every now and then, at least once a week, I go to court, I go to the bulletin board, and then I find deals. You then contact the owners directly, try and strike a deal with them. If you call 10, 20 people, you're definitely going to walk away with at least two deals. And because you know your numbers and because you know the 80-20 uh, principle I always talk about, by the time you get there, you already know. And also remember, when you do that, you're going there with what you call the friendly knock. But in this friendly knock, you already know the position the person is in. So you know that the person is going to be foreclosed on, you know that they are distressed. You know that they're having financial problems. You're not going there to go kill them. You're going there to go relieve them from some of their financial burden. And if you go there respectfully and you know how to connect with people, it's very easy, very, very easy to get a whole lot of deals with just putting a small amount of money down. Mm. I'm in conversation with Echo Carger, who's the founder and CEO of B Grand Holdings. And we're talking about finding and buying affordable properties and you sharing five techniques that you can use to do just that. Uh, I certainly want to hear from you at home if you've been able to buy a property at a really good price. What strategies were you able to use? How did you go about finding that particular property? Was it you know, as simple as going on privateproperty.co.za or did you have to find it via other means? And what were those means? Do share with us down here below. We want to hear from you. And of course, later on on the show, we will be announcing who the lucky winner of the 500 Rand cash prize is going to be. This is of course for the spot prize that we are going to be um, you know, handing out as we are running the Sherlock Holmes competition. Now, the winner of the weekly winner of the Sherlock Holmes competition is announced every single Friday, but there are going to be spot prizes along the way, and that's, of course, more reason for you to enter the competition and certainly get your friends and family to enter as well. Perhaps they may be the lucky winners of the spot prize, if not the 5,000 Rand voucher on Friday. So there's certainly quite a lot to walk away with um, here on Private Property, and do make sure that you're following us across our social media platforms and participating. You can also follow myself on at Zamandunga underscore K and we keep the property conversations going on. Now, Echo's already shared those first two techniques. The one is, you know, focusing on the rundown properties. The second being distressed sales. Now, the third one, I'm very excited with this one, Echo, because we've spoken about it with an attorney um, who was last week, which is the installment sale. So take us through why this is such a great benefit but I know the viewers at home, uh, a lot of them probably already know what an installment sale agreement is. We've spoken about it. Um, but just briefly, what is the installment sale agreement and why we should potentially consider this as a method of buying um, a property? By the way, Zama, install installment sale agreement is my favorite. And I do that at least once a year. If I don't do it in a year, I feel like, you know, I'm going to die. Installment, installment sale is so great because... It's just written, it's written all over. It says the owner is willing to carry the loan. That's what it says, basically. So, and there's a lot of strategies, especially during COVID. Actually, we've done a lot of installment sales deals during this COVID. And why? Because the owner, if you started the deal properly, there are two things you're going to get out of it. Owner is going to finance the deal. So it means that you don't really need to go to the bank and get the bond or get a bank to finance you. By the way, that's another way to raise 
to raise capital in the market by using somebody by leveraging off the owner's property. So the bank is going, uh, the owner is going to finance the deal because their credit is not that bad. It's just they don't, the liquidity is bad. So they'll finance the deal for you. Some owners are actually not that the liquidity is bad. They actually have a whole lot of money and they just want to get some tax shelter. And therefore they will do that kind of deal with you because they will still be able to use whatever that they're using to get some money from the tax man. And, 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 and that's a very crucial, you know, for tycoon investors like us, when we buy property, it's, it's two things that we look for really. It's the liquidity and the tax shelter. Those are the two things that actually make us good money. So, so with installment sale, basically that's it. It means that you, you need to find, a, again, a person and how do you get installment sale? From the owner's point or the seller's point of view, you need to demonstrate that you are a trustworthy person. You need to, your word is everything that you have and you need to be able to show that. Once you've done that, I know in South Africa, you need to, once you've done this deal, you need to close it off over a 60 month period, which is five years. You need to, you need to close this deal off in, in five years and you do it over three or four, five installments. That's how it is. But inst installment sale is easy and it's written everywhere. It just takes a lot of time to get to that deal because you have to do a lot of paperwork but you can get out of it. And if you use the disclosed um, distressed property deal that are foreclosure, you can close installments deal, a lot of them before the bank foreclosed on your client. And that's what you have to do. We've got a question here coming through from our Facebook page and it is from Uri Joyce Mashaba who asks, what will, there we go. Um, a rejoice is asking us on Facebook, uh, what will you advise a person who wants to take a loan and buy land where he or she can build rental rooms, especially in townships? Okay, so whichever the strategy is, it's good. The, you must always have one thing in mind. If you're going to be building, for sure, people think that building is easy. It's not that easy. So it's not that easy. So the numbers must make sense. You need to make sure that you've got the right team. Otherwise, you're going to buy land that you're paying bond over it and it's not generating any income. And then you're going to get frustrated and you're going to say, oh, this property game is just a story. It never works. So that's the thing. My advice is that if that person is a newbie, play this game like the game of Monopoly, right? So get one house that's an income or get a property that's got a sizable space at the back and buy so that immediately you can generate rental income. But if you've got the money available or if the bank is going to give you that money, then why not? By the way, the bank actually, when you're going to buy land, they give 40 to 60%. So you always at a disadvantage when you're just going to buy land to develop. But if you buy the land cash, then you can go all the way to 70%. They never give you 100% on improvement finance. So those are the things that people need to consider. As opposed to when you have a property on a big land and you go to the bank, you can actually get 100% for it, depending on your credit history. So you need to put those things into perspective and think properly which approach you want to take. But buying to renovate I mean, to buy in, to develop is always a good thing. You, the important thing is that whatever that you're developing, somebody must pay for it. If you're not breaking even from day one, forget it. That's not any business to go into. And I think to, you know, to Joyce's question, one of the other things that if you're going to be taking out a loan and not, not so much, let's say a home loan or a bond, but a, let's say a personal loan to buy the land. Um, I mean, the question that I would probably ask is who's paying for the developing? Um, because I'm also going to assume that you don't have the cash itself to do the building. So you're essentially acquiring the land you know, on loan, you're going to be building on loan. Have you factored that in and have you factored the interest of you know, purchasing the land and then the interest that you're going to have on building as well. Um, and just the cost of building and not just the financial cost, but there's also the time factor cost and the toll that it takes on you as the person who's essentially running that operation. So you almost need to watch your numbers closer 
when you want to go into a building operation um, as much as possible, especially if you're building from scratch. You know, I know that oftentimes, like I see, some people would use different options, like there's already a house that's there and maybe they first just start with doing back rooms, um, you know, first, and they want to build, let's say, double-story back rooms. Maybe as you're starting off, you just rent out the house. So there are all these very different creative ways you can go about financing um, a project and in a nice sort of phased out and staggered approach so that you're not taking on too much financial strain um, from the get-go. We've got a, another question also cut from Facebook. It's coming from Uspami, um, who asks, are house prices dropping since business and the economy has been bad? Uh, I have my own take on this one, but Echo, are the, the, the prices dropping right now? Uh, so it depends on the area. Generally, the house prices are taking a knock, but it depends. So what's, what, what influences house prices to, to drop or increase, right? And you've got two things. It's affordability, which is driven by the income, the household income of a family, and the interest rate. Well, actually three things, and the tax. So the interest rate, we've gone down and we've gone down and we've gone down due to COVID and whatever the economic factors that play a part now in this current environment that we live in. I don't foresee that we'll go, we'll get another 200 basis point down. It's not going to happen. I don't foresee that. And clearly our taxes are not being reduced either. So it means that the only thing that can drive the house prices up is affordability, which linked to the, your, the income of, uh, of, a, a particular, of a household. And we all know that companies are now retrenching because of what COVID has done to us. There's a lot of instability in the market. So if this goes on, and remember that there are still some foreclosure deals that are going to come to the market. It's just because of COVID, you cannot put people on the street. So everything has been held, but there's a lot of, I personally, from my research, there's a lot of, um, Lots of properties, there's a lot that we eventually, down the line, we're going to have more supply than demand. And when we have more supply than demand, obviously the, the housing prices will drop. So I say, yes, I have, a, I have a good feeling that the housing prices will drop. By how much? That's a question to be answered by the market. Mm -mm -mm. And I think when it comes to, you know, um, prices dropping. What we've certainly seen in the latter part of last year is that a lot of the properties uh, below the 1.5 million rand mark, there wasn't much downward movement in terms of the purchase prices. If anything, there were certain properties where the pricing went higher than pre-COVID numbers. Um, however, in the luxury market, that's where there's been a, a more significant drop in property price. Mm -hmm. So it, it really does kind of depend on which, we'll say, price point um, yes. you're looking at. We know that those who are buying luxury homes are, you know, in a, are, it's a smaller pool of, of buyers. So I think it is worth um, sometimes viewing multiple properties um, before you make that offer, because there are prices, as I was saying, where we saw an upward movement instead of prices remaining the same. Now, Echo, the next strategy is the low money down um, deal. Take us through that one. Okay, so low money, low money down deal basically means that you do not have to look good on paper. It means that, the, again, the owner is willing to accept certain a small amount of deposit. And why? Because majority of low money down deals is basically unbonded properties. And you can do a lot of deals like this with unbonded properties also, if you can bond with the owner and you can show that you're trustworthy. We've done a couple of deals. We haven't done a lot of this as compared to the installment sales, but we've done a couple of these deals. And basically, you just need to assure that, and, and, and normally it's an old person, that's our strategy, an old person that's willing to downsize into an old age home or wanting to have a small apartment in a nice neighborhood just to, just to relax, and, and retire because of security or they don't, whatever personal reason that they have. If you can afford to meet those kind of people, you'll be able to put a mere 10% down. All you have to show is that you're going to be able to pay the, 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 the monthly 
whatever agreement that you have with that person as, um, as honestly as possible and re um, religiously as possible. When you do that kind of thing, actually those people, you remember old people know a lot of old people. The deals will be coming to you and, and you wouldn't be chasing the deals. And that's basically what you need to strive for. You need to strive for integrity. You need to strive for honesty so that you'll be able to grow your empire, if I should put it that way, because people help you to grow your empire. You will never grow any empire by yourself. You need people. And honesty is key. And, and Echo, before we close off, that last technique that our viewers at home can use? So the, it's the find, so that's, come back to the 80-20 principle. So you have to find the prevailing rental in an area. And once you find the rental in that area, normally what I do, I pose like a, a prospective tenant. And if I find out that landlords are willing to give concessions like um, helping you to carry your load or your, your goods to the property or giving you one month free rental, you know that the rental market is soft. That means that there's a whole lot of vacancies in that area. And if you use that principle and that knowledge, you'll be able to get a lot of properties on the market from the, directly from the owners because they're tired of it. They're not getting any income and they'll rather sell and take the money and put it in an, an, another deal or whatever that they wish to do. Mm. So using the prevailing rental is also very key. Mm. And Echo, as we wrap up, you know, I think one of the big things with a lot of our viewers at home, they were going to want to find strategic ways of growing their property portfolio this year. What would be your one final tip to viewers at home when it comes to growing their property portfolio in 2021? So the first tip, if you want to grow your property portfolio in 2021, again, liquidity is key. You need to make sure that you've worked your numbers, you need to understand your ROI. If people do not know what an ROI is, it's a return on investment. And they can watch my video that I've done on why ROI is the best number to look at in, in, the, in, in, the, real, in the real estate um, environment. So they can watch that on YouTube at Property Ask Echo. They can also watch the video of finding your first investment property again on YouTube at Property Ask Echo. But the, the bottom line is that if you don't look, you will never find anything. And if you're waiting to get the best property, you will die a virgin. So you do not have to wait. You need to understand the numbers and you need to take action. You need to go into that property. You need to see the property. You, of course, you need to be comfortable with the, in the area that you're investing your money in. You need, to be, you need to be able to go there. And if you're, going to, if you're not going to be able to go there, and if you don't like the area and you think the property is cheap, you're going to, to be honest, waste your money. So they need to get out there. They need to get out there, find properties and get it done. That it's, it's, basically, it's basically four Gs that I use. I say, uh, get out, get it done, get it done right and get out. So those are the things that you need to do. You need to get out to look for that property. You need to work your numbers. You need to understand the numbers. You need to get it done right. It boils down to fixing the property, looking after your tenant, making sure that the property that you, you've invested in or the property that you're renting out, you can see yourself sleeping in that property. And if you cannot see that, you're not going to make profitable investment. You'll probably make money now, but it's not going to last. And you're always going to be catching up to the market because people will leave and move into properties like Zamas, well done property, Echo's well done property. And that's what people look for because you must remember these days, people have choices. It's not those days that they just dump people wherever and people just accept it. Even if it's in barrier, it needs to look good to get the right rental. Mm. And that's definitely a great place uh, to leave it, Echo. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's a pleasure, Dr.